Well, howdy, everyone. I'm David Glazer. And I'm Katie Elton. And uh, we're here to, to do a little podcast for you today, I guess, basically. Um, we're talking about voluntary refunds, internal investigations, trips, tricks, and trip wires. If I say that five times, bad things are going to happen. It'll be like car talk, but less practical. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Hopefully, just as funny. Yeah, no, we won't be <laughs> Maybe <as> not. <laughs> uh, and I can't do a Boston accent. No. From Katie. All right. So a couple quick announcements. So first, our next webinar is on July 8th. And uh, Bob Klapinski and Catherine London are going to talk about clinical trial agreements. And then we're not sure of our August topic yet, so we'll deal with that. This presentation and all of our other, well, the last couple of years worth, are available on SlideShare. Um, there, uh, that information will be coming out in uh, an email will be coming out in an email that you'll get so you can look at this and our other webinars on there remember the internet is sometimes slow over the lunch hour so if the sound goes to heck in a handbasket Robert puts out the number you can dial in there all right we have a ton of material we, we way over materialed it today and we have an interesting problem which is some of you guys have heard us speak a billion times and could give the speech and some of you are on for the first time and so I hope you'll both indulge us a little um, and some of our most interest, interesting stuff is at the end. So at the beginning, we're going to fly a bit, um, but we'll get to the good stuff at the end. So first, just a couple of general points. You know, people often think, what can you do to prevent an audit as you're doing your internal reviews? And I think that's totally a trick question. You are going to have statistical anomalies. So get your anomalies happen bumper sticker and wear it proudly. Um, the question is whether your anomalies are a sign of a problem or not, and really, We'll talk a little bit about how you can figure that out and how you think like an investigator. So if you could only have one piece of data as part of your compliance plan, or compliance review, what would you choose? You know, you can get one thing and one thing only. And I'll tell you what my answer is. I would get RVUs. Um, at least this is, now this is more in the physician world. You know, obviously in the hospital, in the hospital world, actually there's no one piece of data I think that really works. Um, but in the physician world, that piece of data is RVUs. And the reason is if, if the work was really done, I'm going to be a lot less stressed about the situation. I'm primarily worried about billing for things we didn't do. So that, I'm going to look for RVU data as my one data point. Now, of course, that isn't the only thing you have. But so you're going to want to look at documentation, obviously. You're going to look at coding distribution patterns and production. Diagnosis coding is something I used to not worry about too much. We're getting all weird. ICD-10, one of the things that's going to increasingly mean is that we're paying on the basis of diagnostic coding. Diagnostic coding has been the, I like to call it a stepchild because that's, the, uh, that's, what's the, I don't know, it's, it's been underappreciated. It has not been sufficiently, uh, and well, I don't even know if it's been not sufficiently appreciated. It hasn't been important. It's about to be important. Uh, pay attention to your nervous employees and your credit balances. Hopefully, you're all looking at graphs like this, but I want to make a point that's a little contra-normal. I think most people would look at the doctor who is up there at 100% in 99204 s and say that he or she is inherently a problem. And I don't know that he or she is a problem. I think for all kinds of specialists in particular, you have a typical encounter, and it's going to have the same basic history, the same basic exam. And, you know, if you're an oncologist, most patients who come in are going to get the same basic workup. And so it isn't crazy to me that all of your initial encounters are going to be at the same code. That does not blow my mind. But what we need to figure out is if that's true for this doctor, and that's really the question. So data alone doesn't tell you you're screwed up. You have to think about it. Not going to spend too long on this, but just remember compliance plans get put to the test. The OIG wants to know about what kind of reviews you do, what kind of training you do. You know, are you keeping a record that you listened to this webinar? Because if you ever get in trouble, every step you took to be a good actor is useful. You know, does your hotline get used? Do you track all of your refunds? Record keeping is often the bane of a compliance program, and make sure you have a lot of it. Hopefully, you're asking employees at least semi-annually, maybe even quarterly, to certify whether or not they have any compliance concerns. We have a whole webinar devoted to that on October 9th of 2013, and from the SlideShare site, you can, you can watch that and get lots more tips in that vein. So... Who should do an internal investigation? So, Katie, kind of, if, if you're going to pick who's going to do an internal in investigation, kind of what criteria would you apply? Well, I think instead of thinking about the title, who, which titled person should do it, I think the first question I'm going to ask is, who do people, who will people talk to? Um, 
if you have an in-house attorney but everyone's sort of scared of that person, I wouldn't pick that person to do the internal investigation because if you're going to be doing interviews, at least one where you're going to be talking to witnesses, you want someone that people feel comfortable with. So I think that's the first guiding principle. And I think that whole the, the, ignore the title, it really is about personality matters, including things. Who's going to ask the next question? Um, letting well, and Actually, we'll, we'll come to that one in a minute. But you, you want to generally have two people there because there's a possibility you might need a witness. For, for There are multiple reasons. Having one person asking questions and another taking notes, two people is clearly a way to go. Cost is obviously a factor, and, and we're aware of that. And so you may want to have internal people doing things. But who are people going to be most honest with varies in, in some parts. Sometimes someone they know draws people out better. Sometimes people they know where it's outside the organization works better. People are often very worried about losing their jobs. I've had a rash of very nervous interviewees lately. And those people, I think, are often more comfortable talking to someone outside the organization who they think might keep things confidential. On the other hand, I've had situations where someone had a really good rapport with the compliance person, and they're going to feel more comfortable talking to that person, perhaps, than an outsider. And then, of course, there's privilege. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on privilege, but it's an important question. And so we've got, there are two privileges or, or labels for privileges that are there. There's the attorney-client privilege, which protects work done by lawyers, advice sought from lawyers. Um, that's The question there is, is the communication furthering the, the obtaining of legal advice. When a compliance staff go off and do interviews, you're not actually working under the attorney-client privilege. I will even often use that term, but it's not perfectly accurate. You're really working under the work product privilege. And there's an important distinction there because materials prepared by the non-lawyer at the direction of counsel are only going to be protected if they're in anticipation of potential litigation. And that's not always going to be the case. And in fact, it's not clear when it's the case and when it's not. If you're doing a generic, let's review all of our coding and see if we have any problems, you'd have to argue that there's so much litigation in the healthcare world that you that all investigations are in anticipation of litigation. That may be aggressive. And, um, and it, it will depend on your jurisdiction and what the courts have said about that as well. Absolutely. And you'll hear um, a lot of consultants who are advising to do a, an internal review who say, okay, we have to do it under the privilege, we have to do it under the attorney-client privilege. They're largely talking about the work product privilege because if they do the work, it's not attorney work. And so that may not be privileged. <laughs> We're fans of doing it under the privilege anyway. And one of the reasons is I want a shot to edit whatever report the consultant writes. And so if he or she sends it to us so we can look at it and see if we think there's anything in there that's harmful, that alone is really valuable. And so I'm a fan of using the privilege, but you have to recognize that it off, it, if it's not done in anticipation of litigation, it may not be there. Then there are the other exceptions. If you communicate the information too broadly, that can blow the privilege. You know, if you tell the government, you know, if, if in an interview someone says, oh, my lawyer told me this. If you share it with another organization out there, um, if we're talking about business advice, or if, if Katie or I help you commit fraud, um, which I hope we never do. I hope not. Uh, that is not privileged. You don't need to label, like you'll see people label an email, attorney-client privilege. That is not required for something to be privileged. The label isn't part of it. It's just helpful because when people are doing reviews, it lets them see what's there. Um, so Katie, have you ever seen a situation where an interviewer was doing something that you thought was really unhelpful? Unfortunately, I have. Um, I think one of the most unhelpful things is when the interviewer uh, is sort of a know-it-all, um, and the witness is being asked a question, and the interview and the witness answers, and they're still sort of answering, and the interviewer says, "Oh well, yes, that's because of um, you know, of course we wouldn't do that. I could understand why you wouldn't you, why you wouldn't agree with that," and then moves on to the next question. Let the witnesses talk. You need to be open. You, you need to be comfortable with a little silence so that people can think. Are you saying you should interrupt people, Katie? <laughs> people need to think about what they're saying. And oftentimes, uh, when we give people tips about how to give testimony on the stand, one thing we'll say is to the witness, be comfortable with silence. And people aren't. They just keep talking. And when you're interviewing someone or when you're crossing examining someone, you want them to keep talking. So allow them to do that. And I often start interviews with sort of a weird little spiel. Um, and I'll say, hey, if you're a fan of cop shows, you know, on a cop show, you know you're not supposed to repeat hearsay. You know, that if you're testifying in court, they're not going to allow hearsay. You should only testify about what you yourself have seen or heard. But in an interview with us, I want hearsay. And I will explain that rumor 
an innuendo is our stock and trade because it's possible that the rumor is wrong and finding out that the rumor is wrong may be, maybe the rumor is the antecedent of the investigation and discovering what caused that rumor will let us squish the investigation or it may be that the rumor is right and that's important for us to know but I want to encourage people to tell us what they've heard and also that often allows people to report things that they may not feel comfortable doing, they'll say, I've heard. And so I encourage people, I always ask the questions, what do you know and what have you heard? And I think that's a really good strategy in the course of an investigation to get people to talk and to help them feel comfortable. So the rules of evidence don't apply to investigation interview? Most certainly do not. Um, I, I'm just going to give credit, by the way, to one of the best pieces of advice. Catherine London, one of our colleagues, was with me in an interview once. We were preparing someone for a government investigation and she said that in the course of the government investigation the person should uh, should act like they're a teenager talking to their parents and I thought that that was a really good way of, uh, of of prepping someone for an interview with the government and if we were doing that here we'd be I'd be a lot terser <laughs> uh, okay last thing you know I'm I don't think you have to do things the way everyone else does them and I've heard lawyers say don't do phone interviews because how can you tell if someone's being honest if they're on the phone and I would say a couple of things to that. First, I don't think you can tell if someone's being honest generally. Lord knows I've been conned before, you know. And and I think phone interviews, actually, there's something about the anonymity of the phone that can be advantageous. And so I'm not at all adverse to phone interviews. At times, I kind of like them. Not only can they be more cost effective, I actually think that there are situations in which they're more effective. People might be more agreeable to do a phone interview than to come in and do an interview in person anyway. Absolutely. So that's one way just to get the information. But if you have lots of documents, well, then that's not so that's good. I mean, you, you can try to use one of the computer programs, but it's not ideal. All right, don't want to spend long talking about consultants at all, but you know we're talking about the work product privilege. There are some consultant horror stories out there. We've talked about these in other speeches, but you know, uh, the, the person who was going to turn in their report to the OIG if we made them write one, that kind of stuff. You, made, you need to know if your consultant thinks of themselves as your advocate or your policeman or person. Do an interview person. with them before you hire them. Yes. Actually, I think people don't do enough diligence. No, with, they hear a good name and then you hire. And I, so that's, check it out. So uh, this is a question I get asked, I don't know. Uh, Katie, how often? Once a week? And sure. Once a day? Yeah. So if we refund, will it raise a red flag? And here's a cartoon. Katie was teasing me about this cartoon, and I guess that's proper. But now, stay calm. Let's hear what they said to Bill. And so you can see Bill there in the upper right corner. So, Katie, if I refund, am I raising a red flag? Not necessarily. No. I, lots of people refund. It's like people say, if I report a HIPAA violation, are they going to come after me? There are lots of reports done. Um, you're not necessarily raising red flag. And in fact, you're maybe establishing that your compliance process is sound. I think it's a bigger red flag. To if you have to refund, not refunding is a way bigger red flag. Right. So there's a 60-day rule out there. Katie, walk us through that puppy. All right. So uh, this isn't terribly new news, but back uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, part of that said, uh, made it law that uh, you must report and return any Medicare or Medicaid overpayment that you have received within 60 days of, quote, identification of the overpayment. So this raises two very obvious questions that are still be the answers of which are still being borne out today. So this is just the text of the actual statute that says who you're supposed to report and return to. We'll talk about who to go to uh, in a little while. And then what follows is the, the timeline, the 60-day timeline. So let's talk first about what identification is. When have you identified an overpayment? Well, it's not defined in the statute. Uh, there are a couple different sources from which the government might draw or we might draw to say whether you have identified. The first is the House bill of what eventually became the law um, had said that reporting would be required when you know an, of an overpayment. All right, that's not the law. That was just one potential iteration of it. Um, David, and my theory, is that identification seems to require quantification. How can you identify an overpayment and return it if you don't know how much it is? Um, you know, you can't return something if you don't know how much you're returning. So identify seems to include the dollar amount, too. There was a proposed rule on this back in 2012. CMS proposed a rule to about what identify means. And I think that they did not take your theory and my theory to heart. In they did not. Rule. They didn't even ask us, if you can believe it. Um, that proposed rule said that an overpayment is identified if the 
provider supplier has actual knowledge of the existence of the overpayment or acts in reckless disregard or deliberate ignorance of the overpayment. All right, that's a little bit different than David's and my rule. Right, (laughs) you can be totally ignorant and it's not necessarily bliss. So um, that was in 20, uh, a few months ago, that was delayed because I think CMS said there are significant issues to work out before we finalize this I think this is an important thing to keep in mind about all proposed rules. We don't talk about them that much because they're proposed. They don't matter. Um, And so it doesn't matter. And this one may never finalize. And so when it finalizes, we'll worry about it. It's going to be a big deal. The other kind of data point on what someone might call identify is the recently finalized regulations in the Medicare Advantage context, which um, require, you know, returning an overpayment for Medicaid, uh, Medicare Advantage entity. And that means, in that also uses the word identified, and that says that the MA organization has identified an overpayment when the organization has determined or should have determined through the exercise of reasonable diligence that the organization has received an overpayment. So kind of talking, that was similar to the proposed rule. So um, the most recent development in in what is identify is this uh, continuum Federal False Claims Act case that's pending in New York federal court. Um, This is the first case where we've seen the 60-day rule litigated, and it cuts right to the heart of this identification definition. And the bigger news was last June the government intervened. So this is going to be a newsworthy item um, if it's actually litigated. Um, So here's the fact pattern. We can kind of revisit this as we think about the questions throughout the webinar. So there's this group of hospitals that use this uh, software system to figure out, to tell the hospitals whether they could submit secondary payer claims to New York Medicaid. And so the hospital system erroneously told, I'm sorry, the software system erroneously told the hospitals they could bill Medicaid as a secondary payer for a number of claims. So New York Medicaid comes back to the hospital and says, you've billed these in error, all right? So the hospital knows about some issue for a small amount of claims. And then what happens is an internal person um, who became the relator in this case, the whistleblower, sent an email to the upper management and had attached a spreadsheet with a list of about 900 claims and said, these are the claims that were potentially billed improperly to New York Medicaid. Um, And he was actually fired a few days later, so that's not a great fact for them. Um, and then the hospital took a couple years to actually eventually repay that money. Um, and so the government's theory under the False Claims Act is that uh, the hospital has – David's looking at me like he's going to interrupt. I just want to say, Continuum is a great name. It took them two years to refund. It's kind of amazing that they're named Continuum. It is that was amazing. All I needed to and say. you might know of this as the Health First case because apparently they were purchased and, and that's their new name. So Health First, maybe that's a better name than Continuum. Um, but anyway, uh, so the government said, uh, well, the relator and then the government said that this is a False Claims Act issue because under the False Claims Act, if you knowingly retain an overpayment, then that is a false claim. That's the reverse False Claims Act provision. So by retaining these claims or these payments past the 60 days, then that's a reverse false claim. So that's the government's position. And so the hospitals filed a motion to dismiss that's still pending about six months out. And this is the heart of the question is, was this overpayment identified when the relator sent this email? Um, the hospital has said, no, it wasn't identified because the relator's email said these need further investigation. They didn't necessarily investigate very quickly, but that's, that's the idea, right? And is so that- in that vein, Katie, if, if someone calls up me and says, hey, I think we have an overpayment. We've got a bunch of claims. I don't know what to do. Is the 60-day clock running at that moment? I, no, it's not identified, right? And it's, so we don't know what to do does not means that you don't know. And so that's kind of the main thing. They're, they're saying that it wasn't finished yet. Right. And we'll find out. So this could be a, yet. yeah, this could be a really big case and you'll hear about it from us. So, um, you know, the next question, big question in the statute is what's an overpayment? The statute actually defines that one, maybe not helpfully. Any funds a person receives from Medicare or Medicaid to which that person after applicable reconciliation is not entitled. And I gave a talk recently with a, with a lawyer, and we were talking about does after applicable reconciliation mean you get to offset underpayments? And that lawyer said, absolutely not. Um, it's a cost reporting term. And I said, I think it absolutely does because that's to me what reconciliation means in just plain English. And I think you're not overpaid. If, you know, if I owe you $10 and you owe me 20 
I don't think anyone can argue that I can sue you for twenty dollars. I can sue you for ten. Um, and certainly, cost reporting doesn't apply to everyone who would be returning overpayments. So that isn't quite the right. So I think you get to offset underpayments, and I think it says so right here. But this is another illustration of if you go listen to five lawyers talk about this, you will get at least two different, well, often get two different, and maybe as many as five different opinions. And so what we're going to get into next is the fact that many things that people raise as issues are not overpayments. So poor documentation, violations of condi conditions of participation, and then reassignment problems. And I think the only one we're not talking examples. about in detail is reassignment. And the basic idea on reassignment is if you pay, if Medicare pays the wrong person for an otherwise correct claim, there is very clear language that that's not an overpayment. So you bill for Dr. Katie and the service was done by Dr. David. Um, that's not an overpayment. So we're going to do this part really quick because we've done this a bunch of times, but I think it is worth reiterating. People want to scare you into refunding money, and they'll often use all kinds of strategies. Uh-oh, Danny, sounds like the monster in the basement has heard you crying again. Let's be real quiet and help, hope he goes away. Um, is it a requirement or is it a guideline? We've got for the hierarchy for Medicare, the statute, the regulations, and then the manuals. Something that's in the manuals that contradicts something that's in the statute isn't valid. But we're going to talk about this a lot today. I think the manuals can be more permissive. The position we'd like to take is that the government can always be more, can be more permissive if it wants to. It can waive things. It just can't do something more restrictive than is in a higher level of authority. That's what we would argue. Make sure if someone's telling you something is illegal, get a copy of it in writing. Uh, just had a situation last week where a client had talked to a specialty society and they were giving advice that was inconsistent with ours. We said you can't supervise diagnostic tests, or that nurse practitioners can't supervise diagnostic tests. Trade group said you could. And we said, ask the trade group in writing what their authority is. We can then, that's the only way you can ever compare notes on this stuff. And look at the date that the rule was promulgated. You would be shocked. We recently ran into a false claims act case that we were able to get rid of, but mostly because the relator was relying on regulations that weren't in effect during the time period that he was saying they were wrong. And it's kind of amazing. It, it's amazing. It, it, it went away. It, it went through their lawyer yeah. and everything, and that's what happens. Um, just because someone sounds smart doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. So, all right. Be fair. If you did work, you should get paid for it. If you didn't, you shouldn't. But now here's the theme we want to go with. Be a salmon, not a sheep. Um, what do I mean by that? Swim upstream. You don't want, well, what do you know? I'm a follower too. So I'm going to spend a minute on something. This is, this is language that's no longer operative because the two midnight rule has replaced this. But I hope you'll agree after you hear me out here that this is going to be a worthwhile discussion. This is the pre-two midnight guidance on what it takes to be an, uh, an inpatient an inpatient in the hospital. And remember now, literally, certainly hundreds, I'm going to say thousands of hospitals have refunded short stay to money. Yes. Because they, you know, didn't, the, the person who was in didn't meet the status for inpatient criteria. Most of those people used Interqual or Milliman, looked at what happened over the course of a stay, and said that whatever happened in the stay didn't justify the admission. I'm sure many of the people on this call are people who are charged with looking at what happened in the course of a stay and deciding whether or not admission was appropriate. So let's look at what the manual guidance was. And it's here we can jump to manual guidance because there's nothing defining an inpatient in the statute or the rules, okay? So all we've got is this. Generally, and it, it comes from the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, so read the blue with me. Generally, a patient is considered an inpatient if formally admitted as an inpatient with the expectation that he or she will remain at least overnight and occupy a bed even if it later turns out they could have been discharged. Okay? So our test, you're staying over. The doc, actually, the doctor expects you'll stay overnight. Okay. I'm just going to count one. <laughs> so there's one. kind of feel like we're on Sesame Street. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So let's skip to the red. Physicians should use a 24-hour period as a benchmark, i.e., they should order admission for patients who are expected to need hospital care for 24 hours or more and treat other patients on an outpatient basis. Two. Second test. Now, and I'm going to just say there, 24 hours and overnight. The only time that those are the same is in Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle, um, like for some period in the winter. But otherwise, I'm thinking 24 hours and overnight aren't the same. Different. 
However, the decision to admit a patient is a complex medical judgment, which can be made only after the physician has considered a number of factors. And I'm not going to go with the blah, blah, blah. And that's the third test. So good grief. What is the standard for inpatient status? I'm, I'm looking Who knows? puzzled. Yeah. So I know I wouldn't refund based on and fact yet, three tests. The whole industry caved on this, and, and we don't get it. We're puzzled, um, really puzzled. And I think the lesson here is just because everyone is doing something doesn't mean it's well thought out. Uh, I still don't understand why people haven't stood up and said, no, we're not paying you money on this because there ain't a standard here. So now... Things have changed, but the lesson here is think of how many millions of dollars changed hands here off of a non-standard. All right, so a similar one, and we're going to do this one really quick because there's a whole webinar you can listen to on this, and that's if it isn't written, it wasn't done, isn't the law. Everyone looks at their physicians. They find results like this, you know, and you've got Dr. D, who looks like the biggest problem on here, but who may not be, you know. And we'll, um, Dr. E was the president of the group right, using random code allocation. So the lesson is, if it isn't written, it wasn't done, is not the law for Medicare. So we have to put a little asterisk. Medicaid in many states requires explicit documentation. Now, if you're hearing this for the first time and you're going, David, what are you talking about? What I would recommend is that you listen to our August 2012 webinar on this. You can find it on SlideShare. If you don't want to dig through SlideShare to find it, Actually, we'll pr we'll, we can put it in the email we send you, or send Katie or me an email, and we'll email you a link to it. But that's going to be our answer because we got a lot of stuff to cover. But trust me, if it isn't written, it wasn't done, isn't the law. It's based on this statute, which requires you to furnish information, but doesn't say it has to be in the medical record. It's based on this question and answer, which are in your materials, and we're not going to go through now. Um, so this is just there for you to look at, and you can go through that whole slide. I do want to spend one second because I continue to see this. If you look at this slide, there are what I consider to be mistakes on it. And no, it's not that Dr. E adds up to 99. The term undercoded and overcoded are not helpful. And I, we should banish them from our vocabulary, which isn't to say I don't accidentally use them. All you know is that the documentation exceeds the code build or doesn't support the code build. And in fact, in the modern world, you sometimes have this problem with the template, um, the, soft and, or the, the woman with a soft and supple prostate, uh, the amputated leg that had a pulse. You know, you see this stuff because stuff carries forward. Just because it's in the record doesn't mean it was done. Just because it isn't doesn't mean it wasn't. Get the word audit off of your vocabulary. For more detail on that, watch that other webinar. And so that's all there. You know, so we're just blowing through this stuff. But I do want to spend a couple minutes on this. So you've got a situation where you decide that doctor, a doctor billed for E&M services that he or she didn't perform. Now, and you've got to calculate the amount. So are you going to look at 10 charts? And so you, are you going to pull 100 charts, find a 10% error rate, and then project that to a larger universe? And my answer on this would be no. I don't think that works in this situation. And here's why. Um, I don't think you're going to the, – the goal is not to figure – I'll start this sentence and finish it someday. <laughs> so the test isn't documentation. Ultimately, what you're going to try to figure out is whether the work was done or not. And that's where our RVU thing comes up. If you've got a doctor who's got crummy documentation, we're going to ask, does, do the RVUs suggest that the work was really done? And if they do, we're not refunding. And if they don't, we're going to refund. That's not a documentation analysis. And so what happened in the charts doesn't matter. What we're really ultimately doing is trying to figure out how much work the doctor did, and then if we think that we build for more work, we're going to refund the difference. So let's say our doctor was two times the 90th percentile for RVUs. What we're ultimately going to do is try to figure out where we think he or she may have been. And maybe, you know, if this doctor didn't ever take vacations. Yeah, we're going to look at schedules. We're going to talk to witnesses. We're, we're going to do more than look at the chart. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, we're the chart's not going to look at the chart. The chart's not going to be probably driver. not going to be good because you didn't have time to probably do it. Yeah. And so w then if we figure out that maybe, maybe we figure out this doctor worked way harder than average, we think they were maybe appropriately at the 100th percentile. We're going to say that they worked that many RVUs, and we're going to calculate a refund accordingly. Um, now, another thing I like to focus on in intellectual consistency, I am a big fan of intellectual consistency in refunds. And I think we often don't think things through. Because let's say you looked at 10 charts, and you found documentation was crappy on three of them, and you refund. 
the obvious question is you kind of now have a sense that this doctor is wrong 30% of the time, give or take. Why are you not going to project to a larger universe of him? What's your intellectual reason for quitting it at the ones that you looked at there? And I think it's hard to come up with it um, unless what, if, if you know, it's hard to come up with an intellectual reason to stop there, frankly. But if your conclusion is, well, he or she did the work so you don't need to refund, that's intellectually consistent and honest. And you really want to make sure that you're, you can defend your decision making through here. Um, and so you don't want to generally handle things differently because it's a small dollar amount than a big dollar amount because you want some kind of intellectual honesty in your approach. All right, Katie, walk us through. So there's, there's, there's COPs. What does COP stand for? COP? <laughs> Actually, uh, not in this situation. So COP is condition of participation. Um, and that uh, the conditions of participation are present for every type of Medicare provider. So you have to be careful about when we say provider and supplier. Most people say provider for everyone. Um, a provider is actually defined by Medicare as a hospital, a home health agency, a skilled nursing facility, and um, a couple of other specialized uh, types of entities. And then most of the rest are suppliers, so physicians, uh, portable x-ray suppliers, um, things like that. So you have to think about what type of Medicare entity you're talking about. And each one has a condition of, set of conditions of participation, or if you're a supplier, you have a set of conditions or coverage. And why am I going on about this? I'm going on about this because conditions of participation and conditions of coverage are different than conditions of payment. What's the abbreviation for conditions of payment? I, I don't, That's that, a good question. I don't think there is one. There is not one. But it one. would be COP, which is what it really screws this up, by the way. Unhelpfully. So. So, so, and why do we care about the distinction? Well, it is because if you have a violation of the conditions of participation, or if you're a supplier, conditions of coverage, that does not necessarily mean the government can take back the money that you build. In fact, there are other, there are other remedies for that. So, for example, now we're the previous slide was about hospitals and whether they need to refund money if charts aren't signed. Um, and here we have, we're talking about suppliers. But the concept is that if the government finds that a supplier or a provider is not in compliance with those conditions of participation or conditions or coverage, then their remedy is to take different actions besides recoup they may be able to kick them out of the program. That's probably the most threatening remedy, but it's certainly not they can take the money back. And so there's some helpful manual language that you should have in your back pocket if you have an allegation, either internally or externally, that you um, have violated the conditions of participation. Uh, this language says, if during a review, uh, it is determined that a provider does not comply with conditions of participation, do not deny payment solely for this reason refer them to the state survey agency. Well, what do we know about state survey agencies? They don't get to take back money. They just get to come in and do a survey. Now that might be a serious thing for you, but it certainly isn't reaching into your wallet. So um, keep, keep that manual language in mind. Um, the, on the supplier side, conditions of coverage is, I think, a, an unhelpful title because it implies that you have to do those things it's, in order for Medicare like to cover to yeah. pay for it, it's but really it, it actually is not. Um, it does does not mean that. Doesn't mean what it sounds like. It does not mean what it sounds like. So like conditions Very, of payment isn't a COP. Is right, right, and and I guess to that point, it's really important. This is, goes back to reading the rule you're looking at. What is the title of the rule? What does it say in the first line? Medicare will pay, and then does it list the things that you have to do? Um, and is one of the things you're that someone's saying you're not doing in that list? And if not, then I'd say you don't have to pay the money back. So um, there was an important case that came out just a few years ago that's very helpful to uh, providers and suppliers in this regard, and that's the Hobbs v. MedQuest case. And in, that was a False Claims Act case, um, and that was a, a, another relator case where uh, the whistleblower said that because the IDTF had not updated its enrollment application to list its supervising physicians. Um, they hadn't done that timely. Therefore, the IDTF was certifying that all the claims they submitted were false and that they should, and the relator said they should have to pay the money back or the government should get the money back. Well, the court came out and said, and made this very distinction that David and I are making today. And it was like, you know, we did a happy dance when we saw the, the opinion. Just be, be happy you weren't watching. <laughs> because 
they said that there are very important nuances. The court said no, important nuances between conditions of participation, conditions of payment, and the conditions of uh, participation cannot be used as a basis for False Claims Act liability or for overpayments. So that is a very helpful case that we will stick to. Okay. Now, we've got a lot of material still to go, uh, and we know that, and some of the best is yet to come, I think. Because we haven't done it yet, that's for sure. Right. So we'll keep humming along here. Um, just highlighting a few things. Like a common question we get, things weren't signed. Do you have to refund the money? And we'd say, no, you don't have to refund. So the Q&A that we were talking about for if it isn't written, it wasn't done, the thing you, uh, if you've, after you haven't heard, go listen to that other webinar. Um, you know, one of the questions is, is signatures required? The answer is no. Then this is, Katie found this language a while ago. This is really helpful. So, so this is just manual language that talks about um, how if a signature is missing, the the contractor won't necessarily doesn't necessarily ask for money back. Instead, they say, "Can we get a different signature and attestation?" So that's another point that this is not the basis for for recovery. And, and we'll just real quickly cover. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things people would say. You know, you're an you you ha you're missing a signed order for an X-ray. Do you need to refund the money? And I think many people would say instinctively the answer is yes. And it isn't, and we know that because when IDTFs came out on Halloween, October 31st, 1997, in the Federal Register, they said IDTFs need to have a signed order, but otherwise diagnostic tests don't require a signed order. And everyone kind of forgets that's there. So I, and, and so one of the things that's hard about this and that will keep Katie and I employed for the rest of our lives is that the answer may vary whether you are a hospital or a clinic or whether you are an IDTF or a clinic. And so answers can vary, but just because something technical is missing, that often doesn't mean you need to refund the money. That's really the main thing we're getting here. And uh, we're going to just make this point real quickly. Just because it's in the manuals doesn't mean you're bound by it. I had a case, you know, you just you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> the government said in its brief, if the manuals go counter to a statute or regulation of a highest or higher dignity, a person, quote, relies on them at his peril. So don't trust what the government says. You know, you read this and uh, it maybe I, makes you want to retire. A it does bit. make you want to retire a little bit. I was already there and now I'm really there. <laughs> um, but while this is annoying language, it has a positive element, which is if there's something in the manuals that suggests you have an overpayment, you may not be bound by it because of stuff like this. And then remember, we have our theme. I think the manuals can give but not take away. Now, I don't know that courts have adopted that theory yet, but it seems like they should. Maybe it'll be like Hobbs versus MedQuest and we'll get to do another happy, happy dance, dance in a few years. Um, so this is just a real quick point. You learn stuff all the time. So I learned from the American Hospital Association about some language that says other than a national, an NCD, a national coverage de dis determination, um, nothing can change benefits unless it's promulgated as a regulation. And I did not know about this statute, but it's really helpful if someone is trying to argue that a benefit is being affected by a manual. Or a local coverage determination. Es especially. That's where we learned this. Yeah. yeah. So um, just something to keep. This, this is another thing to put in the back of your mind. Hasn't really later. been litigated. Watch for it. Okay. Now comes just a but We're just going to work our way through some of the hard questions we deal with. Um, and that cue still freaks me out. It, to me, still looks like I'm going into the, the women's room on that cue. <laughs> All right. So your internal review comes up with an error. Um, you know, you've looked at 10 claims. Three of them are loused up. Do you refund on those three claims, or do you project to a larger universe, and how do you decide? Now, the reason these are called hard questions is that there aren't clear answers to any of them. Right. Here's, oh, so go ahead, Katie. Well, I was just going to say, you don't want to jump the gun. This yeah. one seems to be jumping the gun to project to a larger universe. And, and so one, here's one, we don't have a lot of good data points on this, but one, Janet Rehnquist, who I don't think is anymore, but was the head of the Office of Inspector General, wrote a letter some time ago, I want to say like 2001, that said if you are subject to a corporate integrity agreement, a CIA, and you are doing an audit because of that CIA, and you have an error rate of less than 5%, you do not need to project. You can refund on those claims and move on. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, if you're under 5% and you don't have a CIA, I think you're totally you're good to go. Right. Now, what about 10% and you don't have a CIA? It doesn't say. I, for whatever reason, feel pretty comfortable with that, and I can't point to a source. Um, but now, so let me ask you this. So, Katie, let's say we've looked at 10 claims, and we've got three errors. 
One of them is a dating error, one of them is bad documentation, and one of them was billed under the wrong person. Is that a 30% error rate? Uh, I would say no. Uh, you only have a pattern of errors if the errors are the same. So if you have a dating problem... I have and lots then... of dating problems. But... <laughs> other, other types of problems, I would certainly say you don't have a pattern of anything. And so projecting would be way beyond anything reasonable to do. So here's another one that causes us conniptions, which is you've identified a problem. How large a sample do you select? Um, and I think the answer here in many ways is it depends. And one of the big questions is what kind of money are we talking about? And I realize you may not know until you've done a lot of digging, but if you've got a million dollar problem, I'm going to handle that differently than a smaller one. Now, some of you are thinking, David said be that consistent. we should be intellectually <laughs> consistent. So what the heck? That does not sound consistent at all. And here's how I think it is. Um, when you're dealing with small amounts, I'm going to estimate and round up because the cost of precision is too high. Getting a statistician involved can set you back six grand to start. If you're talking about a $3,000 overpayment, you're not going to want to spend $6,000 on the statistics. It makes no sense for anyone. And so there, I'm going to use a really broad approach, and I'm going to say, hey, um, this is our ballpark, and, and if you can choose different, you know, rounding down or rounding up, I'm going to round up and say, since we rounded up, we're confident we've got the right number. A very different approach. Now, if I've got a big number, so for example, Medicare, actually, how does Medicare, if, if, if Medicare is doing an overpayment, you know, how do they handle it? Well, they, they don't use the midpoint. You know, you don't calculate a midpoint. They're going to use what's called the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval. And you're getting into statistics here, but if you think of the bell curve, it's not the midpoint of the bell curve. It's way to the left of that. Um, and so they're rounding down. I mean, they're, they're, they're rounding getting, down. They're giving you the benefit, and they're supposed to. That's what they're manuals say and we've seen a, at least one case where they've taken the midpoint um and, ha and we've had to remind them that they should take the lower bound yeah and they're so all that can say, and that can save a lot of money so so this stuff is hard and i do it kind of case by case and the bigger the amount in, uh, the, the bigger the amount the more likely i am to focus on really trying to make it statistically valid otherwise i'm just going to make sure i can say with a straight face we think we got it right now do you use the same approach for all payers um, it depends on their rules. Exactly. And, and there's sort of an it depends there, too. I mean, so first of all, I am not a fan of keeping money just because it's a private. If we don't think we, we were entitled to it, there are a variety of laws that can allow someone to accuse you of fraud. Plus, I just don't feel very good about myself. First, you have to figure out if the payer uses the same rule as Medicare. That's a super important Which question. People will jump to and say, of course they do. Yeah, and that's far from the truth. And that's a hard question to answer. Uh, it could be more liberal or more conservative. Exactly. The other thing I would say about statistics is um, some of the most important work if you're going to do a sample and you're going to hire a statistician is to figure out who the best statistician is. Um, interview them before you hire them because they might take a more conservative approach. They might take you know, a different approach than you want to. Or they may be unable to explain their approach. Their approach, <laughs> which we've seen too. Um, okay, this next part could be a speech unto itself. Put it could sleep. be a law review article, could, which is, and that's not a and good thing. And that would be terrible. How far back do you go? So we're gonna, but we are gonna go a little into the weeds, but only a little. Um, so, but first, well, I, let me give you the answer right now before we get into the weeds. I think you go back forty-eight months if you're dealing with Medicare. If you're dealing with anyone else, it's too hard for us to tell you here. Medicaid varies from state to state. I will tell you there are states where Medicaid takes the position they can go back for forever. New One York of which is, would be uh, Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota has done that. Me New York, York. does that. Um, so you got Medicaid, don't know. Private payers varies entirely. But I am my, my short answer for Medicare is 48 months. Now, let's give you the long and really convoluted Tortured. answer. <laughs> so Section 1870 of the Social Security Act limits overpayments, and it used to limit them to subsequent to the third year following the year in which notice of the payment was made. In 2013, the fiscal cliff bill changed that to the fifth year. Now, this, first of all, is just hard to explain. I mean, in addition to being confusing. You have to use pencil paper. Yeah. So they focus on the year payment was made. So if payment was made January 4th of 2013, you can recover for five years. So you'd say 2014, 2015, 16, 17, 18. We can recover all the way through the end of 2018. 
Now, oddly, if payment had been made five days earlier, the recovery cuts off a full year earlier. Why? Because that's Who how knows? they wrote it. <laughs> Um, so people often say they can go back five years, and that's not right. It's simple. It's just not accurate because it's really sometimes very close to – it's like six Could be years. up to six, yep. Um, and it's never exactly five. No. Well, I guess it would be on 1231 or something, right? Right. Yeah. So one day of the year, it's five. So really confusing. Good news, I think mostly doesn't matter, but it's out there. Um, now, people often talk about the False Claims Act and says you can go back six years or up to ten years. But – I don't think you're going to be thinking of your situation as false claims. It's, if it's a mistake, which is what I think we're talking about, then who cares what the False Claims Act says? This is where the continuum case may be instructive. Yes. Um, now, the manuals, and that's going to be a big deal, say you can only reopen claims after 48 months when there's evidence of fraud or similar fault. So if I said to you fraud or similar fault, Katie, what would you say that means? I would say it means fraud and something else really, really bad. Yeah, something an intent to me seems key, right? Yes, conniving. Yes. Okay, we'll come back to that. Put that in the back of your mind. So now the law itself is incomprehensible. And we're going to go through this pretty quick because there's more important stuff to come. Um, the, the law is a mess. The way courts and CMS have applied the law, to me, isn't the same as no. what the law says, which is another reason to not spend too long on this law. Um, there's a question of the law changed in 2013. How does that work? If you're looking right now at claims from 2012, do you use the new law or the old law? Um, we don't have an answer to that. I would argue that if the, the, the principles against retroactive application of laws means that a tw 2012 claim is covered by the statute as existed in 2012, not as it exists today, but we don't know. Um, there are two statutes that limit recovery of overpayments, 1870 and 1879. I first looked at these in my first year as a lawyer, which is now like 22 years ago. I thought I understood it then for about a week. Then I realized I didn't. And in the ensuing 22 years, I would say I don't think I've ever totally understand either of those two laws. Um, now, 1870 uses a term. Oh, first of all, they talk about recovery of overpayments. Neither uses the word reopening. 1870 talks about being without fault. 1879 says did not and should not have known. Those are kind of different. The regulations talk about reopening. They don't use recovery. The manuals talk about both limiting, reopening, and recovery. Holy cow. Here's the law. I, given where we're at on time, I'm just going to leave this here. It is it's impossible to comprehend. It is, and it, it just the takeaway is to know that there are these two statutory sections that are limiting when the government can take back your money. Yes. And so if you're in a situation where that is someone is trying to do that, that's when you dig into these. And, and make sure someone that has at that, least mentioned them and thought of them. Right. We put the text in your handout. You can read it if you need, if you have insomnia. Um, but one of the principles here is there's this principle that if you're without fault, Medicare shouldn't be recovering an overpayment from you. So if you can blame someone else, you know, if you are a ambulance provider and you were doing this because a doctor ordered the service, that you can try to use this without fault provision to get out of an overpayment. And actually, we've seen the government agree with that at times. Sort of yeah, there are times they don't, but there and they, I think they should. Right. And there are times that they do. I don't think it works quite as well with an outside consultant's advice, but I wouldn't be afraid to try it. So here's the language for 1879, and so once again, we're not going to slog through this. But now we're going to get into the regulations a little bit. So first, a contractor can reopen a decision basically within one year um, for any reason. Within four years for good cause, which we have a definition of coming up, but I think you could say for any reason they want. Mm -hmm. And then at any time, if there exists reliable evidence that the initial determination was procured by fraud or similar fault. Um, so here's the good cause, and, and we've got the language here, but like I said, I think you can interpret this as just for whatever, almost anything. And, the, you know, the important, important slash scary thing is that you cannot, there's a case that says, and in fact, part of the regulation says you cannot challenge the government's saying what is or is not good cause. So the bottom so, line, you're not so going to So don't waste And this is there. something Katie taught me. Now... So remember, Katie said fraud or, or, or similar fault requires an intent, something that I first argued you know, in a case in 1994, and the judge agreed. Well, here's what the regulations say similar fault is. It's to obtain, retain, convert, seek Medicare funds, which the person knows or reasonably should 
uh, be expected to know uh, that they're not legally entitled. This includes but not limited to a failure to demonstrate he or she filed a proper claim. That does not sound like fraud. So if we're reading this in context, it seems like the regulation is saying they can reopen if you are were dumb and yeah, didn't and know you were supposed to made a mistake and they can reopen at any time. And that does not seem like fraud or similar no, fault to any person that I think would knowingly apply it. Now, this is not what I've seen applied and it's not what the manuals do. No. And it's not how we think about things. But you kinda have to know that's out there in the rule. Here's what the manuals say. So, or deemed without fault in the absence of evidence to the contrary, because the overpayment was discovered subsequent to the third calendar year after the, pa the year payment was made. So this is based on the old wording. They haven't updated this to take a f uh, account the new law yet. Um, kind of similarly, a provider is responsible for overpayments unless it's deemed to be without fault. But they kind of talk about that same without fault. There's this, this principle of 48 months. You know, the carrier hasn't taken action to reopen the payment within 48 months. So we go back, we're going back 48 asks. months yeah. is the bottom yeah. line. So, King, let me ask you, can a MAC ask for records from January 10th, 2011? I mean, that's more than 48 months ago. Can the MAC ask for records? So, yes, a MAC can ask for records. The question is, can they reopen after the, four, the 48 months? And what people miss a lot and what we discovered in a case was that reopening is different than asking for records and so how, what do you think a reopening is you 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 schooled me on this one too so what's a reopening so reopening is actually defined um, as a remedial action taken to change a binding determination or decision that resulted in an overpayment or underpayment okay so if someone just asks for records they're not doing anything to change so the limit would apply when um, when the payer or the contractor has said, we want the money back. We are changing our determination that they were paid properly. Now, that is not the way the contractors think no. of that. They think that if they've asked you for the records. They've reopened. And if they wait two years to give right. you the decision, it was reopened when they asked so for the records. So they can wait forever. And you think they're right on that? No. I, no way. No way. Um, this, so just a quickie on racks. And actually, so... RACs are governed by different stuff, and this is an audit thing, not an internal review thing. The statute says they can go back four fiscal years. The statement of work says that they can go back three years. And part of why I'm mentioning that here is it's illustrating a point that we've been trying to make, which is I think the government can be more liberal than the law allows. The law allows RACs to go back four years, and CMS has chosen to limit it to three. And similarly, whatever the law says about the limits on recovery, in the manuals, they've chosen to limit it to 48 months. And I think they're stuck with what they put in the manuals. And, and not all the RAC contractors know that. They might be trying to take claims from prior to. And, and here, I guess, is in some ways our most important point. If reasonable people could differ, why would you give the money back voluntarily? I mean, if you did the service, ultimately the government may win. But if we're looking at internal reviews and when we're giving money back, um, you're going to be telling them, you, you know, they're on notice. You're sending the money back. If they want to fight with you, they can come back and ask for more. How can anyone accuse you of being fraudulent when you send in a check if they say you should have gone back two more years? You know, that's, I'm just not embarrassed by that. Okay, so how far back do you have to go? Bottom line, we're back to, I think you'd say 48 months. Now, does the 60-day requirement change that? Does it mean you have an indefinite duty to refund money back to 1910? Um, ignoring the fact that the Medicare program didn't <laughs> exist before 1965. I'd say if the MAC can't reopen it, it's not an overpayment. Right. you buy that? You don't. I do. You're not obligated to pay. Okay. Last thing we're going to do, and we may go five minutes over. You know, you guys can always beg off. And, and plus, it's it, as you know, this thing's f available free on the – if you have to, if you have a 1 o'clock, you can listen to the end. But I think this is important. So it's time to self-disclose. We're going to talk about how you do that and things you do and don't do in the letter. So first, there are various – programs you can use. You can use the self-referral disclosure protocol for stark self-disclosures. You can use the OIG self-disclosure protocol. And so I was giving a talk with someone and they said, hey, I think, you know, you can't get a release from a false claims act if you just write a check to the contractor. So you should always use uh, the OIG self-disclosure protocol or work with the U.S. attorney. 
um, because that way you can get a release. You'll, you'll probably have to pay 1.5 times or two times damages, but you'll get a release. Katie, what do you think of that advice? Mm -hmm. You might want to release in some situations, but you wouldn't want to start by paying a multiplier on what you're refunding um, because you need to be paying for the release. And Well, and here's the, the key thing for me. If the government brings a false claims case against you, the odds are at the end of the day you'll pay in settlement about two times damages. Um, maybe 1.5, but generally now they're looking for two. So the question I've got is what's the advantage of going in and paying, you know, why, what's the value of the release? So you pay double damages to get a release or you pay single damages and if they come after you, you pay the, no, uh, again, pay double damages and get a release, you wind up in the same place. I don't think you've gotten any, that release isn't of any value to you then. Um, so I do not understand that advice at all. Certainly don't go in disclosing with the full amount. The only time I'm going in seeking a release, I think, is if I think my client has had rogue employees who have basically committed something intentionally putting that in quotes they've done something malicious then i might go in and try to get a release if we've screwed up i'm single damages refund to the contractor period so what do you say in the refund letter now here's a piece I, my answer has changed on this first one which is do you ever send a placeholder letter and my original answer was no and now i i might sometimes if i think it's going to take a while to figure out what's going on and i'm darn sure money's coming in I, I might send a placeholder letter. Actually, even if I'm not darn sure, because if I get in the habit of do, if I'm if if I'm refunding money on a on a periodic basis, which if you're a large organization, you certainly you are. That. I kind of want them to know that I am looking at this because if some relator goes in and tries to turn it in, I want them to know I'm in process on that. So if I've got something and it's going to take me six months to figure out what's going on, I think I now lean towards sending a letter in. It helps you not be the hospitals in the in the help first case. case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's the letter from? The, it, I never have the letter come from a lawyer. It, that doesn't mean the lawyer shouldn't write it. I think you know you you want a lawyer writing that letter. It's Katie or me or you if you're a in house. But, but it's signed by a non lawyer who you feel comfortable getting contact from the government. But that letter matters a lot, and so you have to write it very carefully, and you spend a lot of time making it short, but it's really accurate. And then it comes from someone who you wouldn't mind having a government agent contact. It's to the contractor. How much detail do you provide? Well, you have to tell them the reason for the overpayment, and you have to be accurate. Otherwise, you do as little detail as you can. And that's and you have to do that because that's in the actual report and return statute. And the report and return statute says you can return it to the contractor. So if someone's saying go to the DOJ, we have to. That's not actually true. And what about – so if it's a small issue and the cost of the investigation would exceed the overpayment, I'm going to write a letter that says something like, this amount is really small. We haven't determined it perfectly, but we're confident that this refund covers the amount for the following reasons and then explain how we reached that level of confidence. Now, here's a sample letter. Everything in red there should make you blanch. So we recently, it's a throwaway word, and I don't like to use it because one man's recently is another man's slow. You know, is 60 days recent or not? I don't want to get into a fight about it, so I'm, what, why, why is the recent important? It comes out. This is a place where literally every word you're saying, does it need to be there? If not, strike it. Discovered one of our physicians was committing billing fraud. Hopefully the Terrible reason, reason, you know, that's <laughs> self-evident. Uh, she was not documenting services properly. Well, as we kind of didn't really cover, but if you hear the other one, that documentation isn't, isn't a problem by itself. So if they weren't billing for them properly, we'd say that. But we don't want to talk about documentation. I don't believe you ever inadvertently bill. Um, a statistically valid sample only if you hired a statistician and went kind of nuts on it. And I never say we've corrected the problem because of the number of times that a client thinks they've corrected the problem and they haven't. Have so what do I say, for example, for that, I would go with the last thing on this next thing. I would say, here are the steps we've taken to improve our billing. That's more concrete. All right. I like to start these letters as part of our ongoing compliance process. It just sounds nice, and I think it's accurate. I am fond of the phrase most appropriate um, or more appropriate, not most, you know, either one. Um, you don't want this letter to be an admission. One of the challenges is that you send in a million bucks and the government comes in and says, actually, you've just admitted to something bigger and they're coming after you for two million. 
and they use your letter against you as proof that you did something wrong. You want to preserve your ability to argue. So I try not to say that we've billed incorrectly. Um, I'm going to say that there are multiple ways of looking at it. This one was probably better. We would have preferred to do it. So, David, you wouldn't put in something like ABC Hospital reserves the right to appeal this at later, you know, in any forum. Ah, so there is right to recant. Now, that's when it, so this was a, one of the coolest things we ever did. It was a long time ago. We had a letter. Client wanted to refund money. We said, don't refund this money. They said, we really want to. We said, you don't need to. The rule wasn't clear. They said, we really want to. And we said, okay, fine. I'm writing the letter then, we said to them. We, the firm, are going to write this one. And we wrote a letter that said, hey, we don't think they need to refund money. They're choosing to do it, okay, against our advice. In the event you choose to seek any additional money, we reserve the right to appeal on this. Well, they refunded four years' worth of claims. The government came in and wanted eight years' worth of claims. And so they had refunded $300,000. The government wanted an additional $800,000 for a total of $1.1 million. We appealed. And this is one of those great moments as a lawyer. We won back not only the $800,000, but the $300 they had voluntarily refunded because we had reserved the right to do that out. It, that's fun. You know, that, that was a good day. We did the happy dance thing. <laughs> um, so that's a really cool thing to do. Um, level we're confident defending is another way of kind of not admitting, but making clear you're kind of, you're walking that fine line. I try not to, we try not to say our attorney has told us because when you say that, you're arguably waiving a privilege. Mm -hmm. So I keep that out of the letter. I also don't like to use the word overpayment in the letter. I call it a refund because we're back to the admission thing. I don't want to admit that what has happened was an overpayment. We're choosing to refund. And if push came to shove, maybe we could defend it, but that's what we're choosing. Co-payments. Uh, Katie oh, made a face. I made a face. Um, we don't like it. It's hard to deal with. I do. Th here's a principle. Be consistent. Yep. If you would bill the patient if they owed you that of money, you should probably think about refunding it to them. Yeah, and state law varies. There might be a rule that you have to turn in money that, to, you know, it, to the state or some other, or it might say you have to actually go back to the patients too. So. Yeah. Yeah, but the state, um, that is cheap. But yeah, so, I mean, yeah, if you owe them money, it might go to the state. Difficult question of whether you rebill or refund, and I've seen I've, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of payers lately that will say you have to rebill. You can't just refund this money. You have to send in a new claim. And one of my favorites is sometimes they'll say that, and they'll say, "Boy, this claim is old, so we're not going to pay it." Right. So you rebill, and then they say, "Sorry, timely filing, me out." Um, re I don't think you have any duty to rebill. No, I don't think so. Um, th certainly, I've never seen a contract, a payer contract, say you have to rebill. Yeah, we I should say they ha you have to give the money back. Okay, so do so do that. Well, I remember one we worked on for a, a large clinic, and they had billed like the wrong side of service, and they wanted us to resubmit hundreds of thousands of claims. And I was like, yeah, really? No. Show us why we have to do that. So push back on that hard. Private payers, you have to pay attention to the contract. And the manuals, because the manuals online are incorporated, and that's where the meat is. Here's a, ch a problem I do not have an answer to. I we just This is hard. Um, you do a sample. You look at um, 100 short stays, and you refund on 30 of them because you didn't think they were properly admitted. The rack comes in and looks at a case. Have you refunded on that case? Good question. <laughs> and it's really hard. Um, and if, the, if it's the issue on which you've refunded, I don't want to yes. argue the answer is yes. Um, you know, this is one of the problems if you refund and not rebuild, but you can't rebuild in a statistical sample. You can't rebuild. This might be a situation where you engage someone, not your lawyer. Maybe you work with your lawyer to talk to your congressperson. If you have a contractor who's trying to do something that you've previously refunded. I mean, David has one example very recently where that actually worked. So think about other resources. But th if this is a really hard problem and it's in situations where you've refunded off of a statistical sample and the audit looks at claims kind of for that same issue. I don't have a good answer to this. I think it is, it's really hard. But I would argue if you've looked at that issue, you've already refunded the money. Now, you could have time period differences. If you looked at the last two years and the audit is the last four, you might have to adjust. But if it's the same issue, I would. But so when you get the letter from the RAC, do you tell them right then? And I would say yes. You have to make sure then your RAC, whoever's responding to your request. Now, you don't necessarily know what they're looking at, though, too. You've just gotten a request for this record. You don't really know till they deny it 
why they are, you know, what's going on and whether it's something you've, you've refunded on. And then our last slide, what about private payers? Um, uh, depends, right? Yeah. Depends on what the rule is. So yeah, so every private payer is different. But I will say this. I think keeping money that private payers have paid, you can trigger a federal health care fraud law. Mm -hmm. And Katie, you're an expert on this. Is Medicare Advantage a private payer? I wish I was an expert. Totally an expert. There's a, I'm an expert in that I have researched this, and I have tried to figure out if Medicare Advantage incorporates the same conditions of payment as traditional Medicare. I can tell you that there is no statute or rule that says that they do. So as far as I'm concerned, Medicare Advantage is a private payer that has their own rules. And... That's, re that's really that's important. Great, except we are seeing more theories of False Claims Act actions brought in the Medicare Advantage context. And does that mean if you have an overpayment with the Medicare Advantage plan that you can't take advantage of the Medicare appeals process? And I think you can't. I mean, that, the truth is you can't. That's not the appeals process you go through on those claims. Right. So private payers are a little harder. You have to know what your contract with them says. You know, and also state law will matter more there. You know, we don't care about state law. And I, you know, we learn things from our clients all the time. I remember we, at the pharmacy audit, and one of the clients called my attention to a, a, a limitation on pharm and pharmacy on that state, and it turns out in like 38 states that limited the period of time pharmacy audits could be conducted. And I have to confess, I wouldn't have thought to look. I mean, like that was an education for me. Um, I now look whenever there's an audit from a private payer to see if there's some weird state law that might limit in sometimes very narrow fashion, you know, physical therapy specific. Um, so it's hard, and you got to look and not forget about that. Well, we went over a minute or two, well, nine. Um, but hopefully it was worthwhile in some shape, way, or form. Uh, our next webinar, don't forget. And, and so if you fell asleep, if uh, something bad happened, you, will, you can watch this one. You can forward this. If you think there's someone else who would benefit from it, uh, watch it on, on SlideShare. If you have a question, you can contact us. You can always send questions to Katie. You can send them to me, anyone here. We love your questions. And the next webinar is July 8th when Bob Kopinski and Catherine London will talk about clinical trial agreements. Have a great day. Thanks.